Now I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Cornwell. She is the executive director for the U.S. branch of the Richard Dawkins Foundation. Prior to becoming the first executive director, she worked as a volunteer at the Richard Dawkins Foundation behind the scenes since its inception. Her contributions include originating and expanding the outcome campaign, pioneering the concept of vignettes, including the famous Four Horsemen vignette, and the filming of lectures available on the Richard Dawkins website. She gained business experience while working in marketing and sales in the semiconductor industry in California. She later decided to pursue her love of science and completed her PhD in psychology at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. More recently, she has been conducting research at the University of Colorado in Colorado Springs, exploring the relationship of various psychological traits to religious belief across the spectrum from strong theism to strong non-theism. Dr. Cornwell's dual experience as a businesswoman and as a scientist brings an unusual combination of strengths to the tasks that face the Richard Dawkins Foundation in America. Let's give a big warm welcome to Dr. Elizabeth Cornwell. It's appropriate that um, I get to talk about the OUT campaign um, today because the OUT campaign truly is a grassroots movement. It, um, it started, I won't go into the long history of it, it started out because when we started, when the Richard Dawkins website went online, we started getting lots of people writing in and saying, wow, this is so terrific. Um, I didn't know there were people like me. This is really interesting. The God delusion was very popular and end of faith and God is not great and so on. And so there was this outpouring of, um, of it, it, there really is more of us. And as Richard started doing his lectures around um, the Bible Belt especially, which keeps getting broader and broader, kind of representing our whole problem of obesity. So <laughs> the, um, the, the, the thing that, the, what kept happening in every signing queue that Richard was in were people saying, wow, this, thank you for being here. Thank you for helping us. Thank you for speaking out. Thank you for being brave and going out there and saying what so many of us want to say. But as Sean Faircloth mentioned earlier, the most important thing was for them to see one another, to draw in crowds of 1,000, 2,000 people in places like Oklahoma and Kansas City and uh, places where you don't normally think of as being lots and lots of atheists. In fact, it's usually in these Bible Belt areas that we get the best response. I mean, going to New York and San Francisco, oh, you know, so what? Um, but in places where people feel entrenched, that's where we really need to speak out. And so the out campaign came from that just kind of rolling along of people expressing the need of having a way of... of of, of saying, I'm an atheist, and there's lots of us. At the same time, there was the, the gay rights campaign um, is, you may think the out campaign is very similar to the gay rights campaign, and you're right. Um, I'm, you know, my background was originally in marketing, and good ideas are always good. Uh, so I'm guilty of uh, I won't say plagiarizing, that's a really bad term in science. I borrowed and uh, used the idea that the gay rights had, the you know, gay movement had used, um, which is the idea, if you know someone who's gay, you're less likely to be prejudiced against a gay person. So the more that gays came out, and the more and more of them came out, the less and less hatred there was toward gays. Well, atheists have a real PR problem, don't we? The A word. And even within our own movement, within the secular movement, people who are non-theists don't like to use the term atheist. They say, oh, it's anti-this, or it's, you know, it's negative. Well, words, we can own our words. 
And we have to own the term atheist. We have to take it for what it is, which means... <laughs> simply living a life without a belief in the supernatural. And if you look in the dictionary, that's all atheist means. It does not mean you're a communist. It does not mean you're immoral. It, did, it does not even mean that you're against religion. It means without. That's what it means. And if that's how you're living your life, and I would conjecture that that's how most people live their lives most of the time. Whether or not they even say they believe in God or supernatural being, they still live their life as if there wasn't one. They buy insurance. They wear their seat belts. They put their children with, you know, padded everything, putting them on the bicycle, right? You know, the kid can barely move. He's got the helmet on his head. We live our lives as if there is no one out there watching over us. So the out campaign, in terms of its grassroots movement, the way, it really, the way it kind of came to be is we put it on the website. We had the simple things of um, come out, reach out, speak out, keep out, and stand out with little blurbs of what each of those meant. And at first, people, we had people complain about it. Oh, you know, this is silly, and you know, we don't need an A to claim we're an atheist. That's too much like the Christians wearing the cross. Um, how many people have an A on? It's so nice to see. Um, so the, all we did was post it on our website, and we invited people to put it on their blogs and Facebooks. And when they put it on their blog, let us know, link to us, and we'll link you on our blog. I mean, we'll link you on our website. And it grew and it grew, and it grew, all on its own. No money, no financial backing, a simple idea that obviously was necessary. It, wasn't, it was a simple idea. I, you know, if, I had, if I hadn't come up with the idea, someone pro else probably would have uh, fairly quickly. But it's a shared idea. And so I would like to thank all of you, because it was just an idea. You all made it work. You all are the ones who have been putting on your blogs and your Facebooks and wearing it on your lapels and talking about it and not being afraid of using the term atheist. It doesn't work unless it's a grassroots movement. And the more of you that come out, the easier it is for others to come out. The clergy project was an outgrowth of the out campaign. The idea was actually Richard Doc, Richard's idea. Um, there must be clergy out there who don't believe in the supernatural, but they're stuck in their job. And then Linda Lascola and Dan Dennett did excellent research and started finding these clergy. And Dan Dennett and Richard are good friends, and so the discussion came up, and you know, what do we do now? Well. We talked to the members of who were being brought in, who were wanting to keep very quiet, and they were very afraid of being found out. So we created a very um, uh, quiet website for them to talk to one another um, without revealing who they are, where they lived. It gave them a safe place. And then we simply handed it to them and asked the clergy members, you do with it what you want and they have. And today we had, right, an, a coming out party on MSNBC. But, but again, this is not a top down, this is what we're gonna do, this is a bottoms up, we need to do this, we need to do more. And at the Richard Dawkins Foundation, we want to facilitate that doing more. That's why we had, um, we worked with Camp Quest. I don't know if Amanda Metzkus is here, but I would like to definitely give her a shout out. She's been doing tremendous work. 
but to have childcare at conferences like this. Um, that's important because it, bring, it allows people of the age of, you know, parenting age, not the old folks like me who don't have anything to do other than my, take care of my cat, and then, or really, or young students who are great, but once they get into the whole family life cycle and job and career, we tend to lose them out of a movement. And that's true with any nonprofit type movement, political otherwise. We tend to lose people in the middle. We get you know, people who are getting close to retirement, their careers are already set, and the very, very young who are starting their careers. We need to bring these other people into the movement, especially women. I spoke out yesterday about women, and for me, thank you. It's, for, for me, it is a, a real thing, a passion. My niece is six, and I adore her. Uh, and um, I, I keep telling my sister the only reason she got to stay around was so she could have my niece. Um, so... <laughs> And I look at her and she's six years old and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, she's not going to have the same opportunities that I had when I was growing up. Her world is slowly being eroded away and she is being placed in an, an, in an, an invisible burqa. And that is frightening. And we need to galvanize people. And I think now is the time we can really, really galvanize women and let them know that we're here and that we can, we can do something. But in order to do that, what we have to do as a secular movement is to understand the special needs of women. Whether or not we like it, women tend to be the caregivers. Not only with their children, but with the aging population, they tend to be the ones that take care of their parents. Women are the ones who do the social networking of the family. Women are the ones who require a social network. Now, as, a, as an evolutionary psychologist who has studied sex differences, these are things that you know, we need to try to understand. One of the reasons why religion has a hold on women, and we do see the data, women are much more likely to be religious and to go to church than men. It's not because women are more gullible. We know that's not true. It is because religion offers a social network, and we in the secular movement have not been able to create the same one. In countries where there is a social network, in Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Finland, religiosity pretty much goes away because women don't need to use Christian daycare in order to have their child be in a safe place while they go to work, especially single moms. These are important issues. I, I, I was driving around in Washington, D.C. the other day in one of the poorer neighborhoods, and sure enough, on a Baptist church, I think it was Baptist, um, there was a big sign, free preschool. Free preschool. What do you think is happening with those kids? And if you haven't read the book by Catherine Stewart, and it's, it's uh, my brain is seizing up at the moment, it's um, The Good News Club by Catherine Stewart, Buy it. Read it. Get her out to speak to groups. It is one of the most frightening books I've ever read. The organization, the money, and the power behind groups who are infiltrating families and taking a child's mind and corrupting it by using public school systems in after-school care where parents think their kids are safe and they're causing children to tell their schoolmates as young as four, you're going to hell because you don't believe in the right kind of God. They're destroying families. Again, the book is called The Good News Club by Catherine Stewart, and she exposes what they do. This is a concern not just, I mean, this is a concern for parents. It's a concern for everyone. But especially women are gonna be the ones going, oh my gosh, what is happening to my child? when I think they're safe in school. Minorities. We talk about bringing in minorities into the movement. We're talking about it the wrong way. We need to relook at that, just like we need to relook at what do women really need. Black atheists have been active for 200 years. We need to go to them and ask to be included in their movement. We need to ask them, what can we do to help you? We don't need, they, they, 
we, we won't need to work side by side. We need to listen to their particular needs that we, the, and, and I, you have to admit that for a long time, when I first started coming to these conferences, it was mostly white and it was mostly white males. Well, we're seeing more women and I am seeing a lot more people of color, but it's not enough. But, so we need to rethink about how we structure that in terms of going to them, going to groups who are already established, understanding the history of black atheists. It's a very rich and powerful history. Latinos, same. We need, to, we need to, to, to talk to them, not think about it as bringing them into our movement, but expanding and, and learning from one another. This sounds almost kind of Buddhist, but there are all roads lead to secularism. And <laughs> And I'm going to close with this. What we need to do is find what people are passionate about. There are lots of things that affect people because of religiosity, in its most, especially in its most extreme form, which is what's happening in this country right now. To volunteer for an organization, to put yourself out, you have to be really passionate. There are there's education, there's science. That's where my passion came from, is science. And then I ended up getting involved in all this other stuff. But <laughs> science, education, politics, separation of church and state, and just socializing. All these things can bring people into the movement, can bring people into secularism, and to fight for what we need to fight. We started yesterday. I really do see that as a start and letting the world know we're not going away, we're here, and we're passionate, we're a little bit angry, but we're also a great group of people and we can do it. And thank you very much.